right, so today is part three of Get Out the Leaven, okay, part three of Get Out the Leaven, and I want to just go ahead and start where we left off, and we just finished in Matthew 23 dealing with all of these things that are the hypocrisies. Now, you don't have to turn to Matthew 23 because we're not actually going to read that, but I want to continue with the idea that we now have learned about leaven. We've learned that it is the hypocrisy of the... Uh, the behavior that actually is the leaven, that we're walking in hypocrisy causes you to sin and causes you to do the things that would be a problem. And we read some of those things in the woe to you, you Pharisees, you scribes, you hypocrite type verses. And we saw the things that they were doing. And we examined if those are things that we're doing. We talked a lot about how that is us. How can that be us? Can you be one of those people like the Pharisees walking in those kind of ideas or types of behavior styles. And so today what I want to do is I want to talk about examining yourself and searching for the leaven. Okay, because we, we really already, I think, pretty much, I think, made a good case for what leaven is. But now let's search for it. What do we do to search for it? And then we're going to talk about what the solution is. What do you do to fix the problem? And so hopefully this is going to be useful and make some sense. So the question that I have for you is, do you have any leaven of the Pharisees? Okay, we know that's hypocrisy. The question is, is both your walk and your talk consistent with the Torah? Is there hypocrisy in our love of Elohim or our love of our neighbor? Because we have those two great framework commands that everything else hangs from and fits into. And so that's going to be where we're looking for hypocrisy. Is there hypocrisy in the way you are relating vertically? In other words, with your creator, with the Messiah, or is there hypocrisy in the way you're relating more horizontally with the other people in the world and in the body? And so I've got a few of the points that came out of the Matthew 23. Are you suffering from voluntary blindness and foolishness? Remember we saw he called them blind fools. Are you suffering from violence? And it was voluntary blindness that he was talking about. It wasn't that they just happened to be blind. Well, then why would you scold somebody if they were actually blind? But they were choosing to be blind. And so you want to be examining yourself and seeing, am I suffering from voluntary blindness and foolishness? Especially when faced, I think this comes up the most, when faced with newly revealed truth or understanding. You had a, a way of life that you had before he opened your eyes and opened your ears. And by the way, it wasn't like an instant download, no, everything is finished and fixed. It was just the beginning when he opened your eyes and opened your ears and started you on a path of asking and seeking and knocking. And we talked about that in the Covenant Community Journey you know, teaching, which is the second one of the CC 101 series, which was called The Journey, how we all have that same journey where he opens our eyes and ears. But in that journey... The opening eyes and opening ears is just the beginning. It's not the end. He doesn't just open our eyes and ears and now we understand everything perfectly. Which means that there's going to be this newly revealed understanding and truth that you're going to come across on a regular basis as you start to walk out the walk and study the word through these new eyes and you hear teaching through these new ears and have a new heart hopefully to receive all of that. But you know what? You could be suffering from voluntary blindness and foolishness in relation to that because it may not be convenient, the newly revealed truth or understanding, or it may set you at odds with family, friends, or bosses, or whatever. And so I want you to examine yourself and say, look, am I suffering in some areas where I'm choosing to close my eyes or turn my eyes away from something? Because that would be foolish, and that's the foolishness part. I want you to be looking to see if you have a zealousness, and this is another one of the things from Matthew 23, a zealousness to draw people to your doctrines, to your halakha, to your walk. Because remember we talked about them going all across the sea and all over the place to make one convert, only to make them part of the garbage heap almost. Remember we talked about the Gehenna. And so, hmm, I wonder if I have any of that. You should be examining yourself. Are you focusing on the minor details while neglecting the weightier matters? And we talked about that part of the woe to you, you Pharisees, where he said, look, it's good that you focus on the minor things, but what about the weightier things? And I think they're weightier, not like 
the Catholics make do with cardinal sins and venial sins and all of this uh, silliness. No, I'm talking about the minor things really only affect you. The weightier things affect everybody. Mercy, compassion, belief. This is affecting more than just you. The minor things like tithing on even the leaves of an herb, like the mint or the cumin, well, this is only affecting you. So what makes it weightier is that it actually has a heavier effect. It doesn't just affect you. So are we focusing on the minor details while neglecting the weightier matters? This is what we're looking for. We're looking to examine ourselves. The leaven of the Pharisees was evident in their daily walk. You could watch them and see what they were doing. That's what the walk means, just sort of watching what they do. Okay, they're doing things. This is what we call the walk, what you're doing. And it was evident. And if we are to closely examine ourselves today, examine our own daily walk, what would we find? Let's go to Tehillim, to Psalm 26 and verse 2. Tehillim, Psalm 26 and in verse 2. Psalm 26 and in verse 2. Okay. Examine me, O Yahweh, prove me, try my kidneys and my heart. So I don't know how many of you are ready to make that prayer, but you should be. That's a good prayer. Examine me, O Yahweh, prove me, try my kidneys and my heart. Now what's this trying kidneys thing? I, bel I believe it's the same like when we say he wants to know what's in your gut. They, they, that's a metaphor they're using, the kidneys. Okay, what, what's your gut reaction to things? What's your default thing that you would do? He says, test me. See what my gut is, where, where, you know, what I'm really made out of. Try to test my heart. Prove me. Examine me and prove me. Hmm. What do people see when they watch your walk? Because they're watching. Don't you know they're watching? Once you started telling everybody you weren't going back to church or you weren't doing this or you weren't doing that and you're doing stuff that you weren't doing before or, or maybe they saw those seat seat on your clothing or some other thing that so showed them that you were doing something different and they asked you, what are you doing? And you said, because of my relationship with my creator, I believe I'm supposed to do these things. You know what they're doing now? They saw you claim to be a child of the living Elohim and to be stepping out in a different way and now they're going to watch. They're going to watch so that they can accuse. They're going to watch so that they can know. Some of them may be watching so they can learn because they may be interested. What kind of example are you setting? What kind of, what kind of evidence are you providing? You know, we wonder about what people see when we walk, but look at this. In Luke chapter 22, we're going to turn there now, Kepha, Peter, is identified, accused, identified as an accused of being a follower of Yeshua. People knew and saw him and knew he was part of that group. And let's see what happened with him. Luke 22 and verse 54. And having seized him, they led him and brought him to the house of the high priest. This is Yeshua they're bringing. And Kepha was following at a distance. Okay, let's start off by understanding that Kepha was following, but at a distance. And it wasn't just like a short distance, because the Greek actually sounds like afar, like he was afar off. So he was making sure that nobody could see him. He was following at a distance. He wasn't like just right there, like, where are you taking him? What are you doing? And like right there. He was following at a distance. I probably read that verse a million times. I never really thought about it until I put it in this teaching, until I believe hopefully the Ruach put it in this teaching. But are you following him at a distance? Are you following him afar off? So that if necessary, you could duck behind a corner or merge yourself into a group of people and become invisible? Because we could all get caught doing that. Because we felt bad for Kepha in the situation, but are you Kepha? Look at what happens. We all know that he ends up denying him three times, but look at what happens. So it starts off with that he's following at a distance. I think that maybe expresses, maybe just coincidentally, I don't believe in coincidences in Scripture, that before we see what he does, 
we're being told he was following at a distance, okay? At a distance. So we then see this. He says, and when they had lit a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Kepha sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him. Your friends are looking intently at you. Your co-workers are looking intently at you. By the way, the people sitting in this room are looking intently at you. We do. Especially the people in the room, the people in the body, in your congregation are looking intently at you. And said, and this one was with him. Well, this is good fruit because they actually saw that he was with him. They, they recognized that he was one of Yeshua's disciples. So that was, that was actually a positive response on the woman's part. It says that the servant girl saw that. But he denied him, saying, woman, I do not know him. He was telling the truth, actually. He had not yet come into that full level of relationship. Remember we talked about knowing is relational. Knowing is relational. He says, I don't know him, not yet, on that level. He knew about him. He spent time with him. He did have a relationship with him, but it wasn't to this level that would have been necessary to go through this process this trial, this test. Again, after a little while, another one saw him, and he said, you are one of them too. But Kepha said, man, I am not. And about an hour later, another insisted, saying, truly, this one was with him too. He is a Galilean too. So they recognized. But Kepha said, man, I do not know what you are saying. And immediately while he was speaking, the cock crowed. We talked about this being the crier for the morning prayers. And the master turned and looked, looked at Kepha. And Kepha remembered the word of the master. See, so he was still following. And the master turned and looked at him. Could you imagine what that must have felt like? You know what you did. And now you know he knows what you did. Because sometimes I think because he's not literally right here in front of us to look at us. We kid ourselves and think he doesn't know what we're doing. That's hypocrisy. Okay? So the master turns and looks at him. And Kepha remembered the word the master said, how he said to him, before a cock crows, you shall deny me three times. And Kepha went out and wept bitterly. This was a transforming moment for him. This could have broken him. Some of you may face moments where you are, let's even use the word embarrassed on this level, ashamed because your hypocrisy is exposed. Because think about it. Kepha was the zealous one. Kepha was the one swinging the sword. Kepha, and here, he's denied him three times. And worse, Yeshua told him he would, and he was like, not me. Oh, no. Pride was still there. But guess what? There wasn't any more pride out there when he went, went bitterly. He got that all crushed. And it could have crushed him. Instead, it transformed him. And you're going to find moments where you're going through a crushing that could either crush you or transform you. Because your hypocrisy is going to be put before your eyes so that you see it, so you're confronted with it. And by the way, he wasn't confronted with it by other people per se. The master himself looked at him. By the way, at some point you may feel those eyes on you and then weep bitterly. But don't let it crush you. Let it transform you. Amen? When people see you, do they see someone who is leavened or unleavened? Do they see integrity or hypocrisy? So what you see is there was still some leaven in Kepha. He wasn't unleavened yet. Because had he been unleavened, he would have said what he would have said later. Later on, you could, anybody could have come up to him. He wasn't denying anything. They told him to stop preaching. He wasn't stopping preaching. They threatened him. He says, threaten all you want. I'm not afraid anymore. See, hypocrisy sometimes comes out of fear. I've said this over and over again. This whole book is primarily the battle between fear and doubt against trust and belief. And he had not gotten to that place where he let go of the fear until that moment. I believe that's the moment he let go of the fear. 
because he realized I would have rather they picked me up and put me in the jail or killed me than feel the way I feel right now. That would hurt less. And that's when he wasn't afraid anymore. Would there be enough evidence in our lives, in our walk? Okay, because this was like in one of those situations where the woman recognized who he was, that he was with Yeshua. But now he's behaving very different than maybe she would have expected. He said, would there be enough evidence in our walk, in our lives, to accuse us of something, of being a part of a body, to accuse us of being Torah observant and followers of Yeshua? Because basically he was being accused. Hey, he's one of them. So there was evidence that he was one of them. But then the hypocrisy came in. Then we had a problem. The fear came in. So I wonder if you would ask yourself that question. I wonder, is there enough evidence that I'm a Torah observant follower of Yeshua? Imagine the following scenario. You are going to be put on trial. Actually, that's not a really hard thing to imagine because you are going to be put on trial. You're going to be standing and, or sitting or whatever before the judgment throne. We know that. So imagine you're going to be put on trial. And we have Deuteronomy 8.2, which you're all familiar with. Okay, we could turn there real quickly, and I'll just quote that out. Because it goes along with what we just read here in the Psalms. But in Deuteronomy 8.2, it says, And you shall remember that Yahweh your Elohim led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you. Ah, that's what Peter needed, right? Kepha needed to be humbled. To prove you to know what is in your heart, whether you're going to walk in integrity or not, whether you're going to guard the commands or not. It's an integrity issue versus a hypocrisy issue. He does, he's not going to live forever with a bunch of hypocrites. And then in Revelation 12 and verse 17, it says, these are those with the testimony of Yeshua and the commandments. Is there evidence of that? That you are among those that have the testimony and the commandments. I'm just going to turn to Revelation real quick just to make sure I've quoted the verse fully the way I want. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to fight with the, rem the remnant of her seed, those guarding the commands of Elohim and possessing the witness of Yeshua. So this is kind of much more overtly problematic than just a person pointing and saying, oh, he was one of them. The dragon was enraged and went to fight out against those who were guarding the commands and possessing the witness. Now, you may think, well, I can deny that. Maybe he'll leave me alone. Well, he might leave you alone, but then you might get left alone by all, <laughs> including Yeshua and the Father, for denying him. So you're in this trial situation, and it talks about it. We read it in Deuteronomy that he wants to humble you and test you and prove what's going on in your heart. So Yahweh will be judging the evidence, and Yeshua has been sent to spend a year with you. We know he dwells in you and all that, but let's just, we're giving a scenario here. And Yeshua has been sent to spend a year with you gathering the evidence. See, because the evidence is not based on what you've told everyone, not based with your public image. The evidence is in your everyday, all-day activities, what you really believe and what's really in your heart. And some of it... The really strongest evidence is the stuff that nobody gets to see. It's when you're by yourself. Because some of you are okay in public. And you've learned how to not shame yourself or even shame the Father in public. But there's other things that are going on in your lives. So would there be enough evidence in our lives? Remember, Yeshua will be here with you for a whole year. Would he find enough evidence in your life to convict you of being Israelites? Followers of of Yeshua, his followers, and followers of Torah, of the teachings and instructions of Yahweh? Or would there be evidence that the prosecution could point to and say, ah, but they did this on Shabbat. Ah, but they didn't go to keep the feast. Ah, but uh, they were eating this stuff the other day. Or ah, uh, You see, because what you do in a trial is you make a case and say, no, my, my client here kept the, kept the Torah. Okay, well, the adversary, which is what hasatan actually means, the adversary, 
And by the way, if you're in a Jewish court of law, the prosecutor is called Hasatan. <laughs> because that's all it really means is the accuser, right? That's what the prosecutor is, the one accusing you of something. So the accuser is going to say, sure, you say he kept the Torah, she kept the Torah. But I know that he or she actually did this and this and this also. And that there was hypocrisy there. What kind of evidence are you providing? You're going to go on trial. Nothing's going to stop that. That's written in this book. I'm going to say it's better than written in stone. It's going to happen. 2 Corinthians 13, in verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, and in verse 5. Examine yourselves whether you are in the belief. Prove yourselves. Or do you not know yourselves that Yeshua Messiah is in you unless you are disapproved? Okay, so he says here, examine yourself. Now, he's going to examine you. But your part of it is examining yourself. It doesn't say for you to examine anybody else. It says examine yourself. Whether you are in the belief. Because, after all, if you examine yourself, you may discover things and be able then to fix them instead of sitting there wishing you had at trial day. It's kind of like the attorney with the client and the prosecutor brings something out that the client never shared with the attorney and the defense attorney goes, hey, that would have been nice to know before we got to trial. Then maybe we could have handled it or something. Defense attorneys do not like surprises, and it's not going to help your case. But you see, the thing is here, there are no surprises, because your case is going to be heard by someone who knows every single thing you ever thought or did. <laughs> there's, nothing, there's no evidence that's going to be missing. You're not going to sit there and go, I hope they didn't notice when I did that. They noticed. They saw. So it says examine yourself. But it also says prove, <coughs> excuse me, prove yourselves. It says examine yourselves whether you are in the belief. So why is it saying the belief? Because it's by belief that we do. So it says examine yourself. You say you believe, you think you believe, you want to believe, but is the evidence show that you believe? What's the evidence of belief? Well, James tells us, I will show you my belief by my actions, by my works. What are your choices that you're making? You know, I did the teaching called decision-making or making decisions. The reason you exist is the reason we're here. He wants to see what you do, what your choices are. When you're put in situations, what will you choose? Are you going to choose integrity or hypocrisy? I wish I had put that on that teaching. So he says, examine yourselves, not anybody else, and prove yourselves. And then he says, unless you are disapproved. He says, he says, this whole disapproved thing, well, in the Greek, it actually has the understanding of being unapproved, and it actually implies being worthless. Okay, literally or morally worthless. So again, the verse says, prove yourselves, or do you not know yourselves that Yeshua Messiah is in you unless you are unapproved or become worthless. <clears throat> so what would make you worthless? Hypocrisy. Because, in other words, what you're claiming is fake. It's a fraud. That's what hypocrisy is, basically. Claiming to be something when you're not. It's a phony. It's a fraud. So that's worthless. If I gave you something, if I, if I had, well, we know this is silver, but let's say I took out a coin, and I said to you, that this is, you know, silver when it wasn't. It's worthless. It's not worth what silver would be. But it might look shiny, and maybe it's silver on the outside. Do you know that they have found, with all of the economy things that have been going on and people getting excited about gold and silver in the last 10 years, that they went and found that some of the bars people were buying, when they peeled away the top layer, wasn't gold. Yeah. It was a fraud. What happens when we peel away your top layer? What's inside? 
Remember we talked about the washed, wa whitewashed, you know, tombs, and we wa talked about cleaning the inside of the cup and not just the outside of the cup, all the stuff in Matthew 23. So we're looking at, have you become worthless because you claimed worth, and by the way, your only worth is if you're in Messiah. Your worth is being in Torah. Your worth is being a child of the living Elohim. Well, if you're claiming to be that and you're walking in uh, opposition to what you claim in hypocrisy, that's worthless. I hope we, we, hope we can, hopefully we can all understand that. I hope we can all see that. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3. Galatians, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay. Chapter 6 and in verse 3. For if anyone thinks himself to be somebody when he is not, he deceives himself. Isn't that what we're talking about? But let each one examine his own work, then, then he shall have a boasting in himself alone and not in another. So you see, this is the same thing Shaul is talking to the Galatians about that he was talking to the Corinthians about. Examining oneself to see. And he says, but each one, let each one examine his own works. Why would he say that? I thought he was against works and we shouldn't be doing works. And works are bad things. No, he said, examine your works. And then he should have boasting in himself alone. For each one shall bear his own burden so we have this problem, of course, with pride. He says, for, for anyone who thinks himself to be somebody, I'm somebody when he's not. Of course, what's the first part of Deuteronomy 8 2? He's going to humble you and then test you and see what you're made out of. Better to examine yourself and fix that problem before he has to do it. He said, for each one shall bear his own burden. Okay, so here, the word for burden is from the Greek word fortion which means actually like an invoice for freight, like on a train or something. So it's like an invoice for payment due. Okay, it's an invoice. And it also has the idea of a task or a service. So it's like, so when it says bear one another's burdens in other places, he's talking about be there for people and help them with the things they struggle with. That's not what he's talking about here. Here he's saying, for each one shall bear his own burden, in other words, his own obligation, task, or service, or Bill of lading, so to speak, the invoice. That's a different understanding here because, it says, oh, each one shall bear his own burden. But wait a minute, in other places he tells us to bear one another's burdens. Different burden. Not the same thing. If you're heavy laden with, with struggles and concerns and, de and you're depressed and other things because you've had all this weight on you, we should go and help each other with each other's burdens. What he's saying is, but each one, now we're talking about your works that you're examining, the things that you're doing, he says, you shall bear your own obligation of what's expected of you, your own tasks that he's given you to do, your own service that he expects from you. See, again, sometimes we have to really, you have to go to the language, you got to go to the Greek, and then if you have to, go to the underlying Hebrew. Because you might say, each one shall bear his own burdens. If you remember other verses, you go, wait a minute. Aren't there verses that say we're supposed to bear each other's burdens? I know there are. You know there are. So is this a contradiction? No. Using the word burden in two different, totally different ways. The context here is, let you examine your own work, because each one's got the burden of the works he's supposed to do. And I'm not supposed to do your works, and you're not supposed to do mine. By the way, that's consistent then with the idea that when Yeshua came and eventually he's on the stake and it's all done and he goes, it is finished. I don't know how they figure that that means that he did what you have to do. That contradicts all this also. He said the task I was, the burden that Yeshua had, he completed. Now that makes the burdens you're dealing with have much more value it's not a waste of time. If he hadn't done his burden, your burdens would be a waste of time. It would accomplish nothing. But because he finished what he was supposed to do, and, and he was, by the way, he wasn't telling everybody he was finished. He was talking to his father. He said, Abba, it's finished. What you sent me to do, I finished it. I did exactly what you sent me here to do. It's completed. 
Now, of course, the job isn't completely done, meaning there's more tasks to do. That task was done. He's got another task called King of Kings, coming with that rod of iron, ruling and leading. He didn't do that task at all when he came. He was not here for that task. His task was to come, to start the gospel being spread of the regathering of the lost sheep, to go ahead and do the, the dying, to bring reconciliation for forgiveness of sins and all the things that we understand, and then be resurrecting, having victory over death and over sin so that he can sit at the right hand. That task he finished. So if he were to examine himself, he would know, himself, he would know, yep, I bore my burden and I took it. I mean, he bore all that burden on himself of what he came to do, and he did it voluntarily. But each one has to bear his own burden. He even says to you, carry your own stake and follow me. You've got to pick up your own stake, your burden, and follow me. Deal with the tasks I've given you. Continuing in the next verse, he says, and let him who's instructed in the word share in all that is good with him who's instructing. And then he says, do not, let, be, not be led astray. Elohim is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he shall also reap. Wait a minute, this is like weird how that verse six doesn't seem to fit in all this. He's saying you gotta bury your own burden. You gotta examine yourself. Don't think you're somebody when you're not. And by the way, for each one, when you have someone that's instructing you, sharing the good with them. Well, that's one of our tasks and burdens is to realize there are those that are helping us and guiding us and instructing us and, instruct, and, and encouraging us in the struggle. Not doing it for you or taking the burden away from you, but telling you, you can do this. Through Yeshua, there's nothing impossible. You can do all, three, all things through Yeshua. And so you have people that encourage you. He says, and share in the good with those that are teaching you the good, that are instructing you in the word. But he says, but don't be led astray. This is where the hypocrites end up in trouble. The hypocrites have convinced themselves that verse 7 doesn't apply. Elohim is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. Elohim is not mocked. See, we somehow convince ourselves. Now, what's mocking mean? It's like being made, in other words, he's being made fun of, being made a fool. For you to claim that if I do A and he told me not to, and in doing A doesn't get me what I want, but I'm going to claim I'm going to get it anyway, this is mocking him, thinking I'm not going to reap what I sowed. But he tells you what sin leads to and what righteousness leads to. But if you're going to sin and expect the rewards of righteousness, then if, if Elohim were to give you that, he would be mocked. It would be a mockery of the whole system, wouldn't it? It would just totally make a mockery of the whole system if you could just do whatever you wanted and he would give you what he said you would get only if you did what he wanted. And he tells you if you do what you want and not what he wants, what you'll reap. And so here he says, look, don't be led astray. He will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. And I don't understand, this verse should scare everybody in mainstream Christianity. All the teachers and leaders out there should be frightened to death that they're teaching people that they're not going to reap what they sow because they're telling them the law has been done away with. You don't have to do what Yahweh said. He says in verse 8, because he who sows to his own flesh shall reap corruption from the flesh, but he who sows to the Spirit shall reap everlasting life from the Spirit. So now we're talking about this fleshly thing versus the spirit thing, which goes back to the same thing with the woes to the Pharisees. They were so wrapped up in this world and getting the accolades in this world and the self-exalting of Matthew 23 and hearing all the you know, great accolades in the marketplaces and getting to have the best seats and all this stuff. They were sowing to the flesh but thinking they're going to reap to the spirit. He says, no, no, no. When you're sowing to your own flesh, you're going to reap the corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you shall reap everlasting life. So when it says sow to the Spirit, we're not talking charismatic, Pentecostals, whatever. We're talking about Elohim saying, we, uh, the Scripture telling us that Elohim is Spirit. And listen to the teaching that we did on the Ruach, on the Spirit. And that the Word is Spirit. 
And so this whole, the intent, the fullness of the intent, the character. He said, if you sow to the fleshly character, you're going to reap fleshly behaviors that go along with that character. Or if you, re, if you sow fleshly behaviors, you're going to re, re, reap a fleshly character. But if you sow of the spirit, of the word, of the truth, of the fullness that is Elohim, the way he would do things, we're told, Yeshua says, imitate me, follow me. If you sow to that, guess what you reap? Yeshua's character. Yeshua's nature. If we would sow to it, very important that we understand this. And then he says, as an encouragement, he says, but don't lose heart. He said, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So then, as we have occasion, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of belief. So he gives us encouraging words after kicking us in the teeth and exposing our raw you know, someone say, well, you've exposed my last nerve. My, my, my nerves are raw now. Oh, no, he's exposing everything. You read this book enough, he's going to expose it all. That's the whole point. He sees all, he's going to expose it all, because how else are you going to fix it? But he wants you to examine yourself to see what the stuff is so you can work on it. And not in your fleshly self, whatever, sovereign way, but when you see it, you can say, Abba, I see it. Now show me how to fix it. Help me to do these things. Work with me. Of course, the first thing you're going to do is ask him just to take it away. And he's going to laugh kind of and say, <laughs> that's way too easy. There's no character in that. Parents, you know this with your children. There's lots of times you, where either you knew better or you've learned the lesson already that if I keep doing for them, they never develop the character if I make them do it themselves. If you're always rescuing them and they don't get the, the, the reaping and sowing thing. Because they're sowing and then you're rescuing instead of letting them reap a little bit. Now, of course, you're going to help them when it's something that really could lead to some serious lifelong damage. But then you have to let them know, but if you're going to continue on this path, I'm going to have to let you reap because otherwise it's not going to get your attention. Because Abba at some point turned to Israel and said, <laughs> I'm not saving you anymore. Not like forever, he said, but I'm, I'm done right now with this group I'm not delivering you again. I keep delivering you and delivering you and you keep ignoring me. No character is developing. Nobody's learning to stop acting fleshly. He says, fine, now you're going to reap what you sow. It's your own fault you brought this on yourself. Scary stuff. But don't lose heart in doing good. So what he's saying is that doing good doesn't always reap immediately. Because that's part of the health, wealth, special gospels of whatever church on the corner over there that says, hey, you just you know, rub the magic genie called Jesus and all your good stuff is going to happen. That's almost the way they treat it at times. I'm not trying to mock them. I'm just saying that's almost the way it sounds. But that wouldn't be reaping what you sow. You're not sowing anything. Let's go and look at the solution. What is the solution to all of this? Let's go to Philippians. Ah, oh, this is going to work out. I will have just enough for today and not need to continue. This is good. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. If then there is any encouragement in Messiah, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of spirit... If any affection and compassion. So if there's going to be any of these things, make joy complete by being of the same mind, having the same love, one in being and a purpose. Now, I don't know what all translations say, but if this is talking about from the same Greek word of saying that I did not come to destroy but to fulfill, and he's saying, well, make joy complete, well, that means there's no more joy. If you're going to use the analogy that when he says, that I, that, oh, Yeshua fulfilled it, so it's done away with. Well, Yeshua himself says, I came so that your joy might be complete. What's in one of the Gospels? So what does that mean? There's no more joy? I love saying that to Christians who want to argue with me. Oh, he fulfilled it, so it's done away with. Okay, so stop being joyful. Why? He said he came here to fill that too. <laughs> 
He says, I came so that your joy might be complete. No more joy. Doesn't sound ridiculous. But we're not taught that way. He says, make my joy complete by doing, by, excuse me, by being of the same mind, having the same love, one and being in a purpose, doing none at all through selfishness or self-conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each one should look out not only for his own interests, but for also the interests of others. Now, if you didn't go any further than this, you might think that there's a mandate here that we should all agree about everything. And then we have to wonder, well, who gets to be right? Because we should all be of the same mind. Well, just so there can't be any arguing, he tells us verse 5. He says, but, to make all this work, he says, for let this mind, for simply says, this is the reason this other stuff I just said is going to work. For let this mind be in you, let this mind be in you, which was also in Messiah Yeshua. That's the mind that he wants us to be of one mind with. Not mine, not yours, his. Let this mind be in you. Now, by the way, in case you're wondering what that means, he explains. He goes further. So in the first four verses, he talks about how we are to treat each other. And this should bring more joy. And that we should be considering others above ourselves and not be selfish and conceited and all those other things. Because there's no mind of Yeshua in that. Yeshua didn't have that thought. And we're going to read about that here in verse 6. Yeshua's mind was one that had him to be at a place where he, being in the form of Elohim, did not regard equality with Elohim a matter to be grasped. In other words, he had no pride and ego issues. He said, and this really got me in trouble. I don't know why it makes no sense. People said, how could you say that the Father and the Son are not equal? Uh, Because he said it. Yeshua said, my Father is greater than I. (laughs) Any any confusion in that statement? Here also, he didn't consider it something to grasp that he was going to be equal. Yes, they're of the same nature, meaning, and of of the same, I don't want to call it species, okay? But there's only two beings in that genre known as Elohim. But they're clearly not equal. Okay, right now, my son, who is, 13 and I are not equal, although we're both Berksons and we're both human beings. But he's 13 and I'm an adult of 53. There's a difference. The thing is, the chasm between the father and everybody else will never be bridged. He will always be greater than all. And Yeshua did not consider it anything because, see, that was Hasatan's failing. He considered it no problem to be equal. I'm going to, I could be in charge. I'm as good as you. Why do you get to be in charge? See, Yeshua was the opposite of that. He was completely humble. So so we're reading this. It says, this is how he did it. Verse 7, he emptied himself. You want the cure to hypocrisy? You want the cure to all these problems? When you're examining yourself, if you can't find yourself, you're doing good. If you find him instead, But the more of you you keep finding, that's the stuff that's got to be emptied out. Not the things that make your personality and make you uniquely wonderful and different and a joy for others to interact with, the individual, the individuality, all that kind of stuff. But no, the the stuff that is the I want, I care, I don't like, that stuff, the sovereign stuff, the stuff that where what you want comes ahead of what he wants. You got to empty all that out. The me, 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 I want it my way. It's got to be blah, 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 blah. Because Yeshua emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, and came then to be in the likeness of men. We're in the likeness of men, hoping to be in the likeness of Elohim someday. He says, and having been found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, death even of a stake. So verses 6 through 8 express some of Yeshua's mindset. He emptied himself. He didn't consider it even to be grasped to be equal with Elohim. He humbled himself through obedience even unto death. Even death of the stake. And the reason it says even death of the stake because you must understand that the stake was used 
because it was the most, in those days, the most shameful way to die. And he was willing to endure that shame. See, most of us will do anything to avoid any kind of idea that someone might see us in a shameful way. To feel that. Oh, they shamed him publicly. That's what that was all about. Everything they did was to do public shaming. But he didn't worry about all that. Because he knew. Verse 9 says, Elohim therefore highly exalted him and gave him a name above all names. Isn't that kind of what we're looking forward to? To be lifted up or exalted by him instead of self-exalted? Well, guess what? You don't get to be lifted up by him if you already exalted yourself. What's it to lift up? See, but you got to humble yourself first. So then he can, like in James where it talks about, and you got to humble yourself before the master and then he can lift you up. So this is the mind. So we're seeing a little bit here about the mindset. What's going on in your mind? Is every thought being taken into captivity? Are you seeing whether it's a thought that's Yeshua-like or just you? And what I'm really speaking of is not like trying to decide whether you should buy this or buy that or do this or do that or whatever. It's about the character-related stuff, the Torah-related stuff. That's when instead of asking, you know, as you're looking at yourself, you know, all these things that we're thinking, it's like the old bracelets, the WWJD. You should say, WWYD, what would Yeshua do? Not what would Yeshua do, like, in terms of mundane things, but when you find yourself in a situation, if Yeshua, if that thought was in Kepha's head, he wouldn't have denied him. If he had embraced that, no, Yeshua would not fear. He would stand. And so when we see ourselves making our own decisions instead of doing what Yeshua would do, and by the way, we have a teaching called What Did Yeshua Do? So you know what he did. And we know that he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Obedient unto death. Oh, isn't this Paul talking about obedience unto death? And we're supposed to be excited about that? I thought that was all done away with, nailed to the cross, blah, blah, blah. No. Yeshua was obedient to the Father and to the instructions unto death. A lot of us struggle just because our boss or family members that we have are close to, you know, kind of make us feel horrible, guilty, or threaten us. And threaten us means some of you guys have been threatened that, oh, well, I'm never going to talk to you again. You have children, family members, parents, whatever, going to cut you off. Some of you have been cut off. And I've had to counsel and deal with those things. Some of you have already been cut off. That's not death. It may feel like death, but it's not death. He was obedient unto death. That's what I was looking for. Those that would be obedient even unto death. That's the mindset you're looking for. That's the solution unto this. Okay, so how do we develop this mindset unto death? I'm going to be really, you're never going to have heard this before. You're going to pray. You're going to study. You're going to fast. And you're going to find somebody to disciple you and help you with your prayer and your study and your fasting. Yeshua and the Father never designed this to be a solo act. He trained up people and sent them out to go disciple, which is to train up more people. That's the solution. It's hard to be a hypocrite when you're under, in a discipleship relationship where someone can call you on your hypocrisy because you have given that voluntary accountability with that person and told them, mold me, work with me, help me to become transformed into the image of the Son. That's what he trains his disciples to do. They were not just trained to go out there and say, hey, by the way, the Messiah has come and he died and was resurrected and now he's sitting at the right hand. That wasn't what he just trained them to do. He trained them to help people come into fullness of belief. That's what we talked about belief in these previous verses. When he says, examine yourselves in 2 Corinthians, you read that, to see whether you are in belief. Because what we're looking for is to develop our belief. And the belief manifests as actions. Let's go to James chapter 1. 
And actually, as long as we're in James, just to remind us in chapter 2, we're going to read from chapter 1, but I want to just remind us from chapter 2, when he says, look, he says, my brothers, verse 14, what use is it if anyone says he has belief but doesn't have works? The belief is unable to save him. If a brother or a sister is naked and in need of daily food, but one of you says, go in peace, be filled, be warmed, but you don't give them their bodily needs, what use is it? Remember we talked about being useless or worthless? That's what the hypocrisy is. If you say to somebody, when they need food, <laughs> go, you know, and do nothing for them, but just say, go in peace and be warmed and filled, what use is that? How about going and getting them clothes and food? He says, so also belief, if it doesn't have works, is itself dead. I think that if Yaakov today was alive and preaching this, he would be accused of teaching salvation by works. Well, because what could he said? Belief is unable to save. What kind of belief? The one that doesn't have works? It's unable to deliver you. You know why? Because the hypocrites don't get in. Then he continues. And he says, but someone might say to you, I have belief. Excuse me, you have belief and I have works. He says, show me your belief without your works and I'll show you my belief by my works. That's what it's all about. All works are, it's not a four-letter word that the church has turned into like a curse word. It simply means the three-dimensional real-world expression of your belief. That's all. I can say anything I want to you, but if you follow me around, you'll see what I really believe. I can tell you I believe this, I believe that, I believe... Yeah, it doesn't mean anything. Follow me around for a while, you'll know exactly what I believe. Because you know what? Everything I do is going to be congruent with what I really believe. It might not be congruent with what comes out of my mouth, that's hypocrisy. If it is congruent with what comes out of my mouth, that's integrity. Even if I'm sinning and I'm telling you I'm a sinner, at least his integrity is a sinner. It's consistent, I'm congruent. I say what I do and I do what I say. He's looking for people that will say his words and do what he says and be in that congruence, in that integrity. Now I'll go back to chapter 1. We're in James, Yaakov, chapter 1, verse 2. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the proving of your belief works endurance. That's what you need to do is as you're proving your belief, you're working, you're building up that strength and that endurance. And let endurance have a perfect work, have a lot of integrity, so that you be filled with integrity and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of Elohim, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it shall be given to him. But he should ask in belief, not doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. See, he's showing you that the same battle I'm talking about is the same battle he talked about. Fear and doubt against belief. But he says, look, but he should ask for belief, not doubting, because if he doubts, he's like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. In other words, other forces will affect you. See, when you have total belief outside anything, elements cannot change or push you around, or toss you to and fro. In other words, circumstances are completely irrelevant to what you do and how you feel because you're in belief. You're not affected by circumstances. Oh, well, I was doing great until all of a sudden my mother got on my case and blah, blah, blah. Or my, my boss told me he'd fire me. Circumstances are supposed to be irrelevant as far as whether you do or don't do. If you believe, then you know what you need to do or don't do. Whether the circum don't let the wind blow and move you around. Because that's all that is when your mother, your sister, your brother, your boss, whatever it is, they're just huffing and puffing like the big bad wolf. Don't let that wind blow you around. He says, For that man should not think that he shall receive whatever from the master. He is a double minded man, unstable in all his ways. Another word for double minded, I think, is hypocrite. Because the hypocrite knows what they're supposed to do, but has convinced himself that they're okay even if they don't do it. That man should not think that he's going to receive anything from the master, 
because he's double-minded and he's unstable. Do you really think the father wants to spend forever with unstable people? Who he doesn't know which way they're going to go? Because that's really what it means to be unstable. I know some unstable people, so do you. And basically, you never know how they're going to react to something because they're unstable. Then you also have some dependable people who are very stable, <laughs> sometimes even if it's bad, but at least they're stable because you know exactly how they're going to react to something. They're not going to surprise you. That's why he says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. Hot or cold is still stable positions. Lukewarm can go either way. He says, and let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field shall pass away. For the sun rose without, let's see, how far did I want to go with this? All the way to 25, okay. So he goes into this, this metaphor here, this picture with the flowers and stuff. The sun rose with the burning heat and withered the grass, and its flower fell, and its pretty appearance perished, so also the rich man shall fade away in all his ways. So he's saying, look, the heat's going to get turned up at some point, and all that appearances and all that stuff on the outside, it's going to be burned away, and it's not going to matter anymore. This is what we talked about in baptism of fire. Whatever the work that he's doing with you is going to be tested through fire to see what work it is. So you may want to go listen to that teaching if you haven't already. He says, blessed is the man who does endure trial for when he has been proved, he shall receive the crown of life, which the master has promised to those who love him. Now, people want to focus on the master promising to those who love him, and they say, well, I love him. He said, but wait a minute, but he says, it's blessed is the man who endures trial and when he has been proved. Because you can say you love him, but remember, it says those who say they even just know him and don't keep the commandments are liars. Yeshua says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so it's not just about saying that you love him. It's about enduring the trials and being proved. Let no one say when he's enticed, I'm enticed by Elohim. For Elohim is not enticed by evil matters. He entices no one. But each one is enticed when he is drawn away by his own desires and then trapped. Stop blaming everybody else. I've said this over and over again. This is more proof of it. You know why you do what you do? Because you want to. Sorry to hit you in the face with that reality. He says you're enticed by your own desires. I know you are disgusted by some of the things you do, but on some level, somewhere, you desire it, or you wouldn't do it. And then you end up in this self-loathing place. Well, get off your whatever and stop self-loathing. Self that's easy to say real quick. Self-loathing and start focusing on developing the mind of Yeshua. More prayer, more study, more fasting, and more importantly, get somebody to work with you. Continuing. Because otherwise you end up trapped. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it has been accomplished, brings death. So here's that process I talked about. So you have a desire, you have a thought, it goes into the heart, it then conceives and gives birth to sin, and then it leads to death, a destiny. Don't go astray, brothers. He says, do not go astray, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no change nor shadow of turning. How do you get the laws done away with and then have this verse? He does not change. There's an Old Testament verse where he says, I am Yahweh, I do not change. I change not. Yeshua is, instead of Yeshua, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. They don't change. No shadow of turning. You know why? They're not double-minded. They're not hypocrites. You can absolutely depend on them to react the way they should react and the way you should expect them to react because they're not changing. They're steady. They're the rock. That's why the rock is such a great metaphor for Yeshua. The rock is an immovable object. It's not going anywhere. You can yell at it and cry at it all you want. It's still going to be right there, a rock. It's not going to just say, oh, I'm scared now and go move away. All right? Having purposed it, verse 18, he brought us forth by the word of truth for us to be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brothers, 
Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of Elohim. See, but I, a lot of you are very quick to speak. You want to jump in and answer everybody's questions, even if there's a teacher in the room. You're going to jump in all over Facebook and be the expert to answer everybody's questions. Slow down. Slow down. Be slow to speak. You may not even understand the question. I've done that many a time where I've had to start. I started answering a person's question only to find out I didn't understand the question. Anybody can make that mistake and think they understand and start answering the question. Slow down. Make sure you understand first. Be slow to speak. Then also he says, slow to wrath. And then verse 21, therefore put away all filthiness and overflow of evil and receive with meekness. Remember that humbleness we're supposed to be becoming humble so that we can be receiving with meekness the implanted word. That's, verse right there says, which is able to save your lives? The implanted word, the truth, the Torah, Yeshua, all of that. He said, and become doers of that word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. See, there's the hypocrisy again. The leavening is being addressed here by Yaakov, by James. He says, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his face, his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and immediately forgets what he was like. But he that looked into the perfect, full of integrity Torah, that perfect Torah, that of freedom. He just called the Torah freedom, not bondage. Sin is bondage. It's freedom. And continues in it. So he's not just saying it was good then. He says and continues in it. And not becoming a hearer that forgets, but a doer of the works. This one shall be blessed in his doing of the Torah. I don't know. Deuteronomy 28 says, keeping Torah blesses. The blessings and the cursings chapter. The blessings come. If you obey, all these blessings come. Yaakov's saying the same thing. Saying they're completely the same thing. Let's wrap this up with verse, uh, let's go to Lamentations chapter 3. It's not often that I get to go to Lamentations. I lament that. I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. In the scriptures, it's the, <coughs> excuse me, it's the book of Eka. Lamentations chapter 3 and in verse 40. Okay? It's Eka, Eka, excuse me, in the uh, scriptures. Right before Kohelet. Okay, Ecclesiastes. So Lamentations chapter 3 and in verse 40, it says, Let us search. And examine our ways and turn back to Yahweh. That's your bottom line. I want you to be looking for the leaven. I want you to be not allowing your dough to remain or to tarry so it can get leavened when you're in worldly situations. Keep yourself separate. Don't allow the leaven to come and get a part of you. Examine yourself. Examine your ways, search it out, and then turn whatever needs whatever part's not right, turn back to Yahweh. That's Teshuvah. Make Teshuvah. Turn around and return to doing it Yahweh's way. That's the letting this mind be in you. So having said all that, I want to encourage us all that it wasn't just about getting the physical leaven out of the house. It was that metaphor that you should really embrace that will change your whole life and more importantly, change your whole character as you start searching for the leaven in you so that you can truly be unleavened. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Avina Malkino, our Father of King. Father, we, we are just so blessed for the depth of word that you give us with the hints and the metaphors and the analogies of both the physical and the spiritual and how the physical points to the spiritual and how all of these things are meant to show us what we need to do so that we can be transformed and conformed into the image of Yeshua. So Father, we thank you for this lesson about leaven and about getting it out of our lives and out of our houses and out of our beings and not allowing those things out there that could leaven us 
to come in. And we understand that by leaven, we're talking about hypocrisy. Which we also understand could be hanging out with people that are in the body, or at least claim to be, and are looking like they're doing things, but they're trying now to convince us to walk also as hypocrites by watering down your word or twisting or altering your word so that it might be more compatible with what I may want, my individuality I prefer. Help us to empty ourselves so we don't have that to deal with. So there isn't any wanting to alter, twist, or change your word so that I can have my way or have things be the way I would prefer. Father, we have so much leaven in us and there's so much that we don't understand and we're also very, it's very scary to look at ourselves in that depth of way. But as we do so, Father, help us to have courage. Give us, have us all be strong and of good courage that when we look at ourselves and look in that mirror, we can walk away remembering what we saw and starting to work on those things we saw. And that, Father, we don't become depressed and we don't just fall apart and just feel like it's a waste of time. I'm never going to get there. Because many of us have felt that. Probably all of us have felt that at some point. Why even try? I'm never going to get there. Father, we should all embrace. And I ask that you would encourage every one of us that you would never have called us if we couldn't get there. You called us because we can get there. And that you will finish the work you started in us as long as we don't quit. And that our main job is to endure, to keep going. And that's why we have that teaching called Endure and Receive the Crown of Life, that, Father, you expect us to keep trying. He says that you're testing us to prove us whether it's in our heart to want to be perfect. And part of being perfect and filled with integrity is seeking out all the hypocrisy and then ridding ourselves by cleaning that house out of all that hypocrisy. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your patience with the foolishness that we do and your, that you have to put up with every day watching us do all the dumb things that we do. But Father, we really do desire to change so that we can examine our ways and turn back to you. So Father, we thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory and all the honor and appreciate your mercy and compassion and the authority given to us through Yeshua. And it's in his name we ask and in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.